to remember we talked about some basic ways we figure out relative time. We talked about the idea, the stratigraphic law, that everything is deposited originally horizontal. We talked about the rule of superposition, that the oldest stuff is at the bottom of the package and the youngest stuff is at the top. We talked about this idea that the basin fills from side to side, this idea of a lateral continuity. And we used this example of the sandy beach moving to the offshore, quieter water, shale deposition, to the further offshore, uh, clean water, quiet, carbonate precipitation. And how we could tell if it was a rising sea level or a falling sea level as everything would transgress onto the land during a rising sea level and regress or retreat from the land moving basinward during the sea level drop. One thing I didn't tell you, and I'll tell you now, is notice how this lateral continuity isn't necessarily going to end up being the same rock type. It goes from what will become sandstone to shale to limestone, all at the same package that was all laid down at the same time. So from a chronologic standpoint, it's equivalent. It's the same. But from a lithologic standpoint, it changes. Those changes in lithology are known as facies. F-A-C-I-E-S, a facies change. So when you apply that in facies change, you aren't just saying, oh, the lithology's changing, but you say the lithology's changing in a unit that was all laid down at the same time. That's different than lithology's changing just because, well, this time it was this, this time it was that, this time it was something else. That would be uh, different times. But here it's unique. It's all being laid down at the same time. The other thing we figured out was we could look at just a small vertical section and we could see this sand shale <coughs> carbonate pattern develop, just like we have sand shale carbonate in a lateral sense. So this vertical section told us that, hey, the shale and the limestone are overlying the sands. This is a transgressive sequence. This had to occur as things were shifting landward as sea level rose. Conversely, if it were limestone on the bottom, shale in the middle, and sandstone on the top, just the opposite pattern, it would tell us it was a sea level drop and a regressive package. So some real neat tricks, these facies changes really kind of help you figure things out pretty easily. We also looked at the idea of cross-cutting relationships, the way something had to exist before you could cut through it. And by trying to work our way through a block diagram like this, we could put things in relative order. Of this had to be there before this could occur. This cut through that, therefore that's young. This, this thing is younger than what it cut through. So we could kind of work from both ends of the spectrum, what happened today versus what was the first thing, and we can figure out the sequence of events that made the, uh, the package. We also, talked about missing time, unconformities. Not only was rock missing, but so was the time represented by that rock interval, the amount of time it would have taken to make and maybe destroy that rock. And we talked about three different types of unconformities. All of them had flat line sedimentary rock on top. But an angular unconformity has rocks that have been laid down, tilted, eroded, and then redeposited on it. This represents a heck of a lot of time because you've got a lot of big stages there. There's a mountain building with that tilt all this to erode it, to uplift it. Then it's got to subside again to become a basin for deposition. So angular unconformity uh, really tells you these rocks have been there for a while. A nonconformity here is kind of at the other end of the spectrum. <coughs> It's just a boundary with flat line sedimentary rock above and flat line sedimentary rock below. A lot of times you'll see an unconformity and you'll go, oh, that's just the boundary of that mythology unit. That's just a change from, say, a sandstone to a shale. And you don't realize that there's time missing there. It's hard to detect. 
And here you've got to look for fossils, some way of age dating those, those units to determine that it actually is unconformable. They're tough to pick up. <coughs> a disconformity is kind of in between, flat line sedimentary rock on the top, but now we've got a big granitic or highly metamorphosed type of rock down below. This would represent something like the Canadian Shield, the core of our continent, with sediments that have been eroded from that core and then redeposited, lapping up on the edges of that shield. And oftentimes we see things like inclusions, rip up clasts in the bottom of the overlying units, the remnants of the erosion <coughs> of that lower granitic or metamorphic uh, body. So that was kind of what we talked about last time and explain a little bit how uh, John Wesley Powell in his trip down to Colorado was the first to see all of this connected together. It was a very unique experience. You just don't get these kinds of exposures anywhere else in the world. And right away, he was able to identify a nonconformity back here, an angular unconformity here, and a couple of disconformities here. He could follow them all down through the gorge. So this really was kind of a, an eye-opening experience. And gave stratigraphers a whole other set of tools with how to approach understanding uh, the geology and its relationships with time. So, here's a clicker question. It might look familiar because we've already done this clicker question last time. Ancient granite overlying by flat line sedimentary rock would indicate which of these types of unconformities. on any of this stuff up here? These are all sedimentary rocks. And the answer is no. We can't age date sedimentary rocks accurately. So the only really good date I have is the Viznuchus date and some of the Zoroaster granite dates, just at the very bottom of the package. I'm going to talk about that a little more in a bit. Okay. So I've got a nonconformity. And a nonconformity is what? Flat line sedimentary rock above. And what below? Flat line sedimentary rock. So it's hard to pick up. How do I know that that surface between those units is in fact an unconformity and isn't just a boundary between two beds? And one of the ways we can really nail that down is by looking at fossils. Because we've been able to figure out the ages of the fossils, and we've been able to figure out the succession of the fossils. So when we have a group of fossils that should be in the order, and they're missing, we know the rock that should be containing them is missing also. 
fossils are nothing more than the preserved remains of past life. And we figure that only about 1% of life ever gets preserved in any way like this. So that adds to the complexity. Maybe that stuff, those animals, those plants, simply didn't exist in this area, or they weren't preserved. So there's always that possibility. So you generally have to kind of work this around and get more than one, one date, more than one uh, thing to base it on. And remember, we base this on the fact that fossils are evolving and changing in an orderly way. We assume that the sequence of this evolution is determinable. That it's ordered, we can figure it out. And it goes from simplicity to complexity. Being Michigan, I kind of have to use a car handle. But look at Henry Ford's Model T and look at a car today. Today, cars have more computing power than the first uh, Apollo 11 moon landing uh, spacecraft. Night and day, you wouldn't even put them in the same species if they were plants or animals. So we expect this to be a determinable orderly sequence and the other caveat is it's irreversible. We don't see things getting complex and growing, and then all of a sudden they kind of start devolving back to their simple forms. That doesn't happen. What we see happening is these big mass extinctions. We talked about those a little earlier, where we see life getting more complex, more abundant, and then boom, something happens and it just wipes out a whole portion of those life forms, those species, those families. And what we see then is not only are there fewer species uh, to start with, but we see the new ones that kind of march in and take over start as different species, but at a much simpler level. And they start to evolve, becoming more and more complex. Sometimes we think that a species simply gets so complex toward the end of its, its span that it's like having a, a car with all its electronics on it and at no time in owning that car is everything working 100%. It's just so complex, something's always on the fritz. And that's kind of the way it is with some of these plants and animals. They just get to be so complex that they, they're just very fragile. They can't keep functioning uh, the way they've evolved. And that brings them to an end. Or sometimes it's a meteorite. Or sometimes climates change. Whatever. So these mass extinctions are major boundaries between fossil types. And they're good ones. Uh, because they're very distinct. And you can see that we've used a lot of those then as defining uh, the periods in the geological uh, column. A lot of times we don't even get to see the fossil. What we see is a representation of the fossil. Um, let's say I've got a shell here, and the shell falls onto the ocean floor, and it gets buried in the sediment. But the shell's made out of calcium carbonate. It's easy to dissolve that basic material in slightly acidic water. So over time, the sediment's compacting in around the shell, and the shell is being dissolved away by the acidity of the water in the sediment. But the sediment compacted and made a mold of the shell before the shell disappeared. The sediment hardens, gets cemented, becomes rock. The rock gets excavated by a geologist, split open, and voila, there is the mold of the shell. The shell is gone. All the shell material was dissolved and carried away with the groundwater. But I have the impression in the rock now of that shell. So a mold is cool. Yeah, that's almost as good as the shell. Or 
maybe the other thing that happened was that mold, that void, got filled in as a mold. Groundwater brought in other material, maybe some silica, or maybe a little silt. But something got in there and filled it. It hardened. And when I crack that rock open, instead of there being a mold, I have the cast. I have a new shell made in the mold, but made of different material than the original calcium carbonate shell. So that's cool. I mean, all of a sudden, wow. I've got this, this fossil shell, but it's made out of silica, not out of calcium carbonate. So there are a number of ways of, of finding out what was there and how to preserve this material. In other instances, we have what we call a trace fossil. It's not part of the animal or the plant, but it's a trace of that animal having passed through the area. For instance, here's an old mud flat, and it was originally flat, kind of along the coast, maybe around an estuary, kind of a muddy estuary area. Since then, it's been turned into rock, and it's been tilted up. So you can see the, the tilt to it here. But look at these things. These are dinosaur footprints. In fact, they're sauropods. And when this was a muddy, flat plain, this dinosaur walked across this muddy estuary, leaving his footprints. And the dinosaur's long gone. He went someplace else. But his footprints got preserved as this muddy estuary turned into, into rock. So that would be a typical trace fossil. So it's going to be pretty, uh, pretty informative, too. So. I've got this problem. I've got <clears throat> I'll crop a rock over here. And then all of this has kind of been eroded away and missing. There's a valley. And then on the, over the other wall, I've got another outcrop. And then it's all covered with woods and forests. And I've got another outcrop. And how do I hook them all together? Well, first of all, I look at the lithologies, the, the material it's made out of, and try and make a, a, a connection. But the other thing I want to look at are the fossils. They give me another clue. For instance, here I've got this trilobite. It kind of looks like a little bit of a, a beetle in a way. And we know they live through this time span. So if I see trilobites in the rock, I'm going to assign it to this portion of the section someplace. Here we've got plesopod shells, and they lived through this portion of time representing that part of the rock section. So 